Today we shift our attention to Rome, the capital city of one of the greatest empires to ever exist. We'll start out by looking at the history of the Republic and the Empire, and then we'll shift our attention to the layout of this great capital city, before then shifting our attention to the key monuments which made Rome distinctive. And we'll conclude by looking at the infrastructure of Rome, which is very much mirrored by the infrastructure of the empire that Rome ruled over. In our last video, we discussed Roman history down to 265 BCE, by which time the Romans had secured all of peninsular Italy. The next year, they entered into Sicily and began the First Punic War with Carthage. At first, it appeared that Rome would triumph quickly and easily, but then the war became a stalemate and lasted for 23 years. During that time, there were some massive naval battles, and after some of those battles, there were storms which destroyed at least two major Roman fleets, and also a Carthaginian fleet. The casualties were enormous, and the cost was high. However, Rome did win. It conquered Sicily, and also acquired Sardinia and Corsica. One of the two islands, Sardinia, Rome actually seized after the war due to a claim that Carthage had not been paying its war indemnity sufficiently. Carthage, for its part, tried to make up for the losses of its territories by creating a new empire in Spain and then using the proceeds from the Spanish mines in part to pay off the Romans and also in part to create a new place for them to do business and expand their civilization. Not surprisingly, Rome thought that this was a great um, threat to them, so the Romans began to provoke another war with Carthage. And this time, rather than being on the defensive the whole time, Hannibal, the Carthaginian commander in Spain, chose to take his army and invade Italy. This led to what was effectively a three-front war. There was the Sicilian theater, the Italian theater with Hannibal, and then the Spanish theater where the Romans were trying to oust Hannibal's relatives. In the end, Rome triumphed, and after defeating Hannibal in North Africa, Rome then annexed most of what Carthage had held in Spain, and thus began a long and painful conquest of Spain by the Romans, one which would not be completed until the time of Augustus. After the conclusion of the Second Punic War around 202 BCE, Rome almost immediately, after only a few years' time, began to fight and conquer Greece and Macedon. This would occupy them down to 146 or so. A few years prior to that, Rome had provoked a third and final war with Carthage, this time looking to completely and totally annihilate that city. The siege lasted for three years. At the same time, Rome also provoked a renewed conflict with its old ally, the Achaean League, in Greece, and that year 146 would be fateful because Rome destroyed both Corinth and Carthage at the same time. Fast forward a little bit, and what we see is that during the course of the second century, what had happened is that the Senate had simply given orders the people had followed, and all of the gains that the Roman people had made in previous centuries in terms of their rights and their ability to have a say in politics had gone out the window. The Senate, for its part, had no intentions of relinquishing any of the rights it now claimed, and this led to a prolonged political conflict. There was also a problem where, because of protracted service abroad, Many soldiers' farms had fallen into disarray, and now they were going bankrupt. Thus, the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer and more homeless. This crisis first came to a head in 133 with the rise of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. He tried to enact land reform, but the Senate ultimately had him killed for his efforts. His brother Gaius grew up a few years later, tried the same thing, met the same fate. After that point, Rome continued to see social strife grow. Um, there was a social war where the allies who didn't have full citizenship revolted. They were being forced to fight in Rome's wars. And when the Romans would redistribute land to some of their poor, it came at the expense of their allies, which was unacceptable since the allies served in an equal capacity to citizens in Rome's foreign wars. What this led to ultimately was a problem with recruitment for the legions. As fewer and fewer Italians qualified for military service, Marius, before the social war, decided that the legions needed to become professionalized. So he recruited men from the cities and equipped them at his own expense. 
He tried to get the Senate to pay all the bills after he raised legions, but what this led to instead was a professionalized army, which was largely more loyal to its own generals than it was to the Senate as a whole, despite the expectation of Marius Sulla and others that it would in fact be loyal to Rome as a whole. Right after the Social War, there was a civil war between Marius and Sulla for supremacy. Sulla ultimately triumphed, but this did not end Rome's political strife. The real problems, as I mentioned, were the professional legions, which were loyal to their generals and willing to follow them even in the Civil War. Sulla's men marched on Rome, and Marius' men were no less willing to fight other Romans for their own gain. The problem of money in politics is that there became divisions between different elite Romans. Some Romans were much richer than others, and they could simply buy their way. Rome had never been equal by any means, but things kept getting worse and worse. This also led to more political strife, including the conspiracy of Catiline, where some very wealthy men like Catiline were not wealthy enough to win elections. So therefore, they contracted debt, started a revolt. Things were messy in the late Republic. Not long after this, um, political strife between the Senate conservatives who wanted to preserve the Senate and not give anything to the people came into conflict with the group known as the Populares. These are basically the kind of descendants of the Gracchi, for lack of a better framing. This group was led by people like Pompey, Julius Caesar, Crassus. The three of them were driven together because they were being blocked at all turns. They created the first triumvirate, and this basically controlled Rome during the 50s BCE. Caesar was able to use his influence in the Senate to enact almost a decade of conquest in Gaul. So this is how Gaul gets added to the empire. Later, Crassus dies, and then the Senate manages to turn Pompey against Caesar. The two of them before had been close friends. Caesar was actually Pompey's father-in-law. Now they're enemies. They fight a civil war for a few years. Pompey dies fairly early on. Caesar keeps fighting against Pompey's successors, including Cato the Younger and some others, and he ultimately prevails. Now he's serving as dictator for life with the expectation that when he eventually does die, he will restore the Republic. However, some people doubt his intentions. They assassinate him. This leads to another round of civil wars between Caesar's grandnephew Octavian, Antony, Lepidus on the one hand versus the assassins led by Brutus and Cassius. The second triumvirate wins and then Octavian defeats Lepidus and then goes on to defeat Antony. And at this point, Octavian knows that the Empire, or the Republic, excuse me, is dead, and that the only way to bring about peace is to end all of this mayhem. We needn't concern ourselves with too many of the details of how the Republic governed itself, but suffice it to say that the Senate had elected magistrates and pro-magistrates who did most of the administration. Most of the pro-magistrates served outside of the city, governing various parts of the lands that Rome had conquered, but they were still important in Roman politics. Most of the magistrates resided in Rome and governed the city, or and also the empire from the city. The people who were perhaps the most important in terms of developing and also running Rome on the daily were tribunes who would see to the needs of the poor, at least in theory, the ediles who put on the great public displays and shows, the praetors who presided over courts. They also could command small armies, but mostly for the sake of this presentation, they are the guys who oversee trials. The consuls were in charge of the state. There were two of them each year, and they were the most powerful magistrates. The proconsuls would usually go out and command armies and govern provinces at this time. These were consuls who had served the year before, or in some cases up to five years before they were appointed to go out and take up some other command. People who had achieved this rank had reached the pinnacle of Roman society, and they were highly influential. Years after they were consuls, they would be visited by large crowds every single morning. There was one office above consul, but it was one which was only held every five years, and therefore there weren't too many of these guys running around censors. The censors are extremely important to what we're talking about now, since they are the guys who authorize most of what we would consider to be infrastructure spending. 
The senators, of course, did all of the governing and most of the addressing people in Rome. However, arguably, the equestrian order was just as important in many ways. They often were also serving on uh, juries when there were high-profile trials. And even for common Romans who had no way to really participate in Roman politics, they could and did watch these trials with great interest since it was effectively drama. Um, equestrians also would do what is known as tax farming. That is that they would bid for the right to collect taxes. And the idea is that you make money by um, paying a lower bid than what you'll be able to collect in the provinces. So this is part of why Rome's tax collection in the Republic was rather chaotic and also somewhat brutal when compared to the Empire, where it becomes much more regularized. Rome also sent out a number of colonies during this time. However, it was much less than the number they would send out during the Imperial period, simply because the Senate was always leery of allowing one senator or another to gain too much prestige by being the patron of any individual community. We'll come back to this point when we talk about Roman colonies in the next video. For the most part, when the Republic conquered an area, they more or less allowed the local aristocrats to control things, and then they would just dispatch a governor who would oversee things, kind of, and make sure that the taxes were collected. So um, the Romans were not very hands-on outside of Rome itself. One of the other features of the Republic is that the growth of citizenship was slow, gradual, and often came with bloodshed, as we saw with the Social War from 91 to 88 BCE. The institutions of the Republic were great for governing a city, and it worked reasonably well for governing an empire. However, there was some chaos built in, the irregularity of the pro-magistrate system, tax farming created a lot of resentment abroad, and the Republic's institutions were simply not all that efficient at managing the empire. To get back to the history of Rome, in 31 BCE, Octavian emerged victorious. A few years later, the Senate gave him an honorary title, the one by which he's known today, Augustus, which means the revered one. Augustus's right-hand man and a guy who will be responsible for redesigning Rome in the image of their imperial administration is Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, pictured here. In many ways, he was the architect of the empire, both in terms of guiding Augustus's forces to victory in the last war against Antony and later in literally designing many of the buildings that will come to characterize Rome. The forms of the Republic actually continue. Rome continues to have consuls, praetors, and all of that stuff. They even have elections. However, the outcomes of the elections are predetermined by Augustus and his heirs. Sometimes they will come to be predetermined three or four years in advance. Yet they are still held because the idea is that the legitimacy of the Senate is derived from the people. Therefore, the people have to give the rubber stamp. And then the emperor effectively claims his authority by virtue of the approval of the Senate and people. So it is necessary in the Roman imagination for them to go through all of the um, affectations of running the Republic. In reality, however, as we'll see, Rome had shifted significantly by the time of Augustus. During the early and high empire, most Roman emperors, when they could, remained in Rome, although sometimes they would venture out to go on campaign or to take up residence elsewhere temporarily. Later in the history of the empire, emperors would spend um, sustained amounts of time outside of Rome, but that is a story for next week. Rome's importance over time will decline as the frontier areas will increase in significance and also as the need for the emperor to respond to crises in those areas will increase. However, until the third century, Rome is the clear-cut capital of the Roman Empire, and it will be here where most emperors will want to really make their impression on the city by giving it different structures and also refurbishing existing buildings. The secret of the empire, as Tacitus lays out in his histories, is 
is that Rome is in fact a military dictatorship. Whatever the sort of posing of the emperors to be the servants of the Senate, the reality is that the only person or the only people that these uh, emperors are responsible to are the guys in the frontier with swords and shields. The secret of the empire was revealed first in 69 CE when the last Julio-Claudian emperor Nero died, and then four men rose up at the same time to try to take his place. That was the year of the four emperors. A century later, a similar situation occurred, and there were five men competing for the empire, the year of the five emperors. In the year 238, something else like this happened, and now there were six men competing for control of the empire. The Romans, after the 3rd century, will no longer pretend that the Republic is still a thing, except for a handful of elites who live in their own imaginations. To build on the idea of the secret of the Empire, this was only a secret to those who were not in the Emperor's inner circle. And also it was only a secret insofar as no one dared to say it out loud. Everyone had already understood this for a while. The emperor, starting with Augustus, became the sole controllers and paymasters of the soldiers. The only way to avoid civil war when men were loyal to one man rather than to the state is if you have all of the soldiers be loyal to the same guy. This was essentially the heart and soul of Augustus's empire. The emperor also controlled all the major political offices, so when he needed to send someone to command troops, he knew this person owed him his position so he would be loyal to the emperor, just as the troops were. In order to afford all of this, the emperor had a very generous allotment to control his personal finances. The emperor more or less ruled Egypt as a personal estate, and it was the revenue of Egypt which would pay for the soldiers' salaries. Emperors would also make sure that other senators and people who were high-ranking were not allowed in Egypt without his permission. Egypt was, after all, the emperor's home and the place where he got all of his money. If his money supply were to be threatened, then his control of the empire would be threatened. It was actually considered to be treasonous to visit Egypt without permission. During the course of the empire, Something like a bureaucracy will begin to emerge, but it never fully divests itself from being the emperor's personal household staff. In many ways, the emperor will manage the empire as if it were just a massive household where he is the father of the family. This process starts slowly under the emperor Claudius, who employs some free men to help him keep his books. He knows that he can trust them because they have no ability to rise based on social prejudice against them for being born slaves. Over time, it will grow, and by the late empire, we'll have something like a real bureaucracy, although it is not actually very big and never exceeded a few thousand personnel in total. This is for an empire of over 60 million, perhaps 80 to 100 million people. And even when it was bloated, in the words of some people who say that Rome was strangled by its bureaucracy, again, only a few thousand people for an empire of up to 100 million, and the only purposes it served were to raise money to pay for the army and for infrastructure. The major increase in expenditure, which required a bureaucracy to raise more revenue, was the army. The Roman army grew in size, expense, and in power as the threats facing Rome grew. And also, uh, armies came to expect payment from every new emperor in order to honor their service. So, uh, if you had an emperor who didn't live very long, this meant that you would have to pay the soldiers again. There was a vested interest in picking emperors who would live for a while. Although, of course, that was hard to predict, given the state of ancient medicine. So, um... The armies also, of course, were responsible for maintaining much of Rome's infrastructure. So in many ways, when I talk about paying for infrastructure in the army, I'm talking about much the same thing. Although, of course, the materials needed to build things like aqueducts would be paid for somewhat separately than the pay for the army. But most of it would come either from provincial revenue or from the emperors on coffers. We also see that over the course of the empire, the state religion 
that is the religion centering around what the Greeks called the Olympian gods, will gradually lose ground to so-called Oriental mystery cults. These are religions from the East, which typically offered salvation or something like it. Some prominent examples include the cult of Mithras from Persia. This was a cult which really caught on with the Roman soldiers. There was the cult of Isis from Egypt. This offered salvation, and it was very prominent among the poor. And finally, of course, another well-known Oriental mystery cult was Christianity. Over time, all of these religions will thrive at the expense of the Roman state religion, and eventually one of them, I needn't tell you which one, would overtake it. As I mentioned in the last video on Rome, Rome was more or less known as the City of the Seven Hills, and in its early history, this was more or less the extent of the city. However, over time, the city would grow beyond the Seven Hills, yet those would still remain some key reference points for local Romans. In the Republican period, each hill would serve as something of a neighborhood, and the hills closest to the Senate House and the Forum tended to be the most prestigious and expensive. Someone would advertise their increased wealth and their success by moving to a different hill which was closer to the Forum and therefore to the heart of Roman politics. The Palatine Hill was perhaps the most um, prestigious of the neighborhoods, and you can see why. It is right near the Forum. I think I mentioned earlier that a lot of people who served as consul or other high-ranking senators often had morning visitors. This is how Romans procured favors from one another, and the size of your retinue, and also the size of people who waited on you in the morning when you got up out of bed, was a way to indicate your prestige. The city of Rome is nearly 20 miles inland, but you can access the sea via the Tiber River. After the Tiber goes south past Rome, it then turns west and terminates into the Mediterranean. Rome therefore created a separate port outside of the city, which would function more or less as Rome's port, even though it was separated by nearly 20 miles. This port is known as Ostia Antica. This area would become vital to Rome's grain supply. When grain was imported to Rome, it would come usually from North Africa, what is today Tunisia, and then into Ostia and thence up the Tiber to Rome. Often there were granaries along the way which would store some of the extra in the case of a shortage. By the time that Rome was in the late Republican period, the city itself was too large to be fed internally. And if you think about the sort of dynamics of keeping a city fed and also the expense of moving grain, it's actually cheaper to grow it in North Africa and ship it than it would be to grow it elsewhere in Italy and move it over land. So Ostia Antica was absolutely crucial to the sustained peace of the city of Rome. When people get hungry and they're crowded in a small environment, bad things tend to happen, at least from the perspective of the property-owning class. One of the most traumatic events in Roman history, although it doesn't get talked about all that much, is the pirate sack of Ostia Antica in 68 BCE. Pirates had become bold and more or less out of control because Rome had decided to destroy the naval power of its old allies because they saw it as threatening. Well, without naval powers and without the Romans maintaining much of a fleet themselves, this meant that piracy was rampant. So the pirates got bold enough that they actually raided Rome's chief port and even carried off a couple of senators who happened to be there. This led to a panic, a white-hot panic, when the Romans felt like their food supply would be cut off. So they enacted what was known as the Gabinian Law, and this gave Pompey, who was already a famous general, a special command with authority to command any Roman forces and magistrates within a 50-mile radius of all of Rome's coast, so basically the whole Roman Empire, more or less, and use those forces to round up and defeat the pirates across the entire Mediterranean. This was an unprecedented command, and many people who study the powers that the emperors had later thought that this was really the blueprint for the powers the emperor would hold later. At any rate, Pompey was able to pull this off. But it all came because Rome had a port, which was apparently vulnerable to pirates. <laughs> 
As for Ostia Antica itself, it was a flourishing city in its own right, and it would really peak during the early empire when emperors from Tiberius to some of the guys in the second century would give it all kinds of different gifts. However, it began to silt up and it became a little bit of a hassle to keep the port open as it continued to silt due to the Tiber. Today, it's actually located a little bit inland because of silting. And this meant that the Romans began to utilize other rival ports, and over the course of antiquity, the importance of Ostia Antica declined. However, because it was not in continuous use, it has been relatively well preserved. And one of the key things that's been preserved here are some of the most intact insulae or apartment buildings. So it's kind of neat to just see a residence. And Ostia Antica is one of the best places to go to see such a thing. Let's talk about city planning in Rome. First of all, the first and most fundamental fact that you should know about Roman city planning is that it did not apply to the city of Rome itself unless there was a fire and a chance to rebuild. Rome was a natural grove city. It was not laid out on a grid and most of its streets were narrow. Until the time of Augustus, most Roman structures, including a good number of temples, were constructed primarily of wood. This meant that they were incredibly fire-prone. The temple, the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus burned down in the 80s BCE, largely because it was composed of a good amount of wood. The Republic had almost no safety standards for buildings. Crassus was a notorious slumlord who built insulae, the insulae you see here on your screen are actually the ones from Ostia Antica, but they probably didn't look that different from the ones in Rome. However, these have withstood the test of time. Crassus was notorious for building crap structures which would collapse in any earthquake or just because they weren't well built. So it was very common for people who happened to live in places run by slumlords to die in building collapses. The city of Rome would become less prone to fire over time, but this was only a gradual process. Augustus supposedly found the city built out of wood and rebuilt it in brick and marble, but really this was a much longer process than that. Nero, despite his negative reputation, actually did quite a bit to help improve Rome in terms of making it more fireproof after the Great Fire of 64. He also, of course, got himself in trouble by using that crisis as an excuse to build the so-called Golden Palace on the site of what is now the Flavian Amphitheater. So how did the Romans actually govern the city? How did they patrol the streets? We know that they had some urban officials from the uh, Aediles to, we haven't talked about them, but there are praetors who helped govern the city. Um, there were keisters who sometimes had authority over parts of the city. And there, were, there was also, in later times, a prefect of the city. But those officials actually didn't do all that much. Most people were expected to govern themselves. So what would happen is that there were neighborhood organizations which would collect fees, and in return, they would collect garbage, carry off bodies, and do that kind of stuff. They also would provide security. Um, basically, the rule was you didn't go out at night unless you had attendants and torches. And if you needed help, you better cry out loud, and then people would come help you, hopefully. So that was really the, about the only degree of policing and organization the city had. The streets would have been pretty nasty. Um, people would dump their chamber pots out the window. Only the very wealthiest people would have indoor plumbing, and even then, mostly that would be on estates where they could set things up themselves. Uh, so the city would have smelled horrible, and rich people, senators especially, would often have attendants who would carry umbrellas just in case they happened to be passing under a window when somebody decided to toss a pot out full of pee or feces. Now on to some of the distinctive features and monuments of the city of Rome. First up is the Tarpian Rock, one of the most referenced parts of the city. This was an 80-foot cliff on the south side of the Capitoline Hill which was used as a place from which to execute murderers, traitors, and slaves who would harm their masters. Basically, people who were a threat to the social order and to the ruling class. This area was used primarily for executions, 
before the construction of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus around 508. That is to say that it was more active before the implementation of the Republic than it was after. It was now only used in extreme cases to make sure that the people saw the enemies of the state follow their deaths. The fa most famous victim of the fall from the Tarpian Rock was Marcus Manlius Capitolinus, a former consul who was a war hero by any standards. He was the guy who held the Capitoline Hill during the Gallic invasion of around 390. However, he was executed from the Tarpian Rock just six years later for advocating debt relief. The Senate rarely took well to opposition to its dominance. It's possible that some of the details of this story, such as the reason for executing him, were invented later in order to justify the way that the Senate had treated the Gracchi. But again, that it goes back to that issue of early Roman history that we addressed in a previous video. Much as Athens was centered around the Agora, Rome was centered around the Forum, which effectively served much the same purpose. The Forum was a rectangular plaza between the hills surrounded by many of the most important government buildings. It also featured a number of prominent temples, some of which we will look at in more detail. The Forum was the heart of Rome from the Republic into the Imperial period. This was the place where public speeches occurred. This is where trials were held. This is where assemblies of the people were held either for election or to vote on various pieces of legislation put before them by the tribunes. The contiones were held here. These are assemblies where there was no voting, but where the public would be informed or riled up, as the case might be, by their elected officials. This was also a place where gladiatorial shows were held, especially before the construction of the Circus Maximus and the um, Flavian Amphitheater. So the Forum was a multi-purpose structure which was used for pretty much everything at one time or another, and as I said, it very much was the absolute heart of the city. One surviving structure in the Roman Forum is the Temple of Vesta. This was one of the most important religious structures in Rome as it housed one of the most important religious orders, the Vestal Virgins. Originally built in 497 BCE and then rebuilt several times after fires and earthquakes and all kinds of other things, the temple was dedicated to the goddess Vesta and the women who served her, the Vestal Virgins. Vesta was responsible for protecting Rome from famines, disease, and military defeats. Anytime Rome faced any of these problems, it assumed that the Vestal Virgins were not doing their job properly and would investigate them to see if any of them deserved punishment. Vestals who were found guilty primarily of violating their oath to maintain the virginity would be killed, sometimes even being buried alive, as happened during the Second Punic War when one of the Vestals was found to be impure. This, of course, was only under the strain of the Hannibalic invasion and in the wake of the catastrophe at Cannae, where around 50,000 or so Romans were killed in a single afternoon. The Vestals themselves came from aristocratic families, and they served from the age of six until they were 36. At that time, they had the option of either going on with their lives and getting married and all that, or they could stay with the temple in a sort of unofficial senior capacity. The job of the Vestal Virgins was to tend the sacred fire of Vesta, and if the fire went out, then the idea is that Rome was in deep trouble. Of course, because they identified primarily as virgins for Vesta, their chief job was not having sex. And if they happened to have a man um, become their lover, this was a capital crime for the Vestal Virgin. It's not clear if it was a crime for the man or not, but I assume that it probably was. Earlier I mentioned that Roman elections were a feature of the Republic. Let's talk about that a little bit more. The voting space was located near the Temple of Castor and Pollux in the Forum, and here you get a sense that the space between the buildings and the Forum was pretty confined. This was true of the voting space where the Romans held their elections. 
there was only one site for all Roman citizens, and it was only open one day. Early in the Republic, when the population was a lot lower, the space presumably was big enough to house all the people who needed to vote. Over time, the Romans added more voting tribes. However, they did so in such a way that it was clear that the wealthy were intended to control everything. So there were up to 35 tribes. However, not all of them had the same number of members. And because of this small space, it took a long time for each tribe to actually vote. The wealthier you were, the earlier your tribe voted, and also the smaller that tribe was. Because there were 35 tribes, 18 tribes would represent a majority. So if the first 18 tribes, who were composed of equestrians, basically, and also well-to-do commoners, if they all voted the same way in their class interest for whatever candidate, well, guess what? The election would then be canceled because there was no reason to have anybody else vote. And the tribe's votes were counted as a whole. So if you had a tribe of, say, theoretically 500 people and 257 of them voted for Catiline to be consul, then that is the vote of the tribe, the end. If 18 tribes vote that way, well, the other 17 tribes consisting of the people don't get to show up. And this happened a lot. And you might think that this is an accidental feature of the system, but it appears to be intentional. The Roman elite had no intention of letting the masses have too much power. However, they could say the masses did technically have the power to vote, and that would be correct. But they rarely got to use it unless an election was particularly divided. Only in cases when the elite themselves were divided were the voices of the masses consulted at all. And usually if some of the tribes beyond the 18th got to vote, it would not be the full 35. So if you were in tribe 19 or 20, you might have a reason to show up to an election. But if you're in tribe 34 or 35, there's basically no reason to ever show up. And by the way, let's say that even if an election went, goes over, um, if, say, the sun goes down, the election ends. It doesn't start up the next day. Elections are held in one day. So that's another incentive to not show up because you might spend all day waiting to vote, lollygagging around the forum, and never get a chance. Interestingly enough, there were secret ballots, however, at least after a certain point. So people did have the privacy to write in whoever they wanted without uh, Roman officials seeing them. This was a right that people gained. However, again, this was a right which was mostly only actually used by people who were relatively well-to-do. Early in Roman history, before the city expanded beyond the Seven Hills, when the Romans would call up their armies, they would essentially select their legions the way that you select pickup teams in a basketball game on uh, outside playground. What would happen is that all the men who were eligible for military service would show up, and then the officials who were responsible for filling out the ranks would select men based on either knowing them and knowing that they were capable or just selecting men who seemed young and strong. In general, the Romans actually had a preference for somewhat older soldiers who had experience rather than men who were younger because younger men tend more to panic if things go wrong and because they're fast on their feet, they can actually escape. Older men are forced to stand and fight. They're not fast enough to run away. So uh, another piece of Roman trivia for you. But over time, the city expanded, and one of the major places where it expanded outward into was the Campus Martius. Of course, over time, this archaic system of the pickup legions would fall apart as well, so it was no great loss. For, at first slowly, but then at a growing pace, major temples were placed all over this area. The forum filled up rather quickly, as you might imagine, so you had to build stuff elsewhere, and the Campus Martius was the obvious place. I forgot to translate Campus Martius, it means the Field of Mars, and Mars, of course, is the war god, so you see how that works out in a very literal sense if you think about what it was used for early on. One of the sort of um, most important features of the Campus Martius was that it was the place where the, sec the secular games were held. The secular games were named for a saculum, which is the Longest span that a man can live. This is a concept basically lifted from Etruscan religion and borrowed by the Romans. The Romans typically held these. I believe that they listed a seculum at 
some precise number, maybe 68 or 74 years, or I forget the exact number. But um, in the Republic, this was typically observed fairly um, continuously and regularly. However, by the time we get to the Imperial period, emperors could more or less just hold the secular games whenever they wanted to. They'd have to come up with an official excuse, but emperors were also the Pontifex Maximus. So they could say that their predecessors had messed up the timeline and that they had miscalculated the dates. Usually it only stood out if you did it between what uh, seculums or secular games, excuse me. If you had one a few years later, the claim that somebody messed up the count would be a little bit more plausible, but the expense of the secular games was such that you didn't want to have them too often. That being said, uh, if you're an unpopular emperor and you need a quick boost to your morality at home, or not your morality, your morale, well, guess what? Holding the secular games is something special. Because even though it's supposed to be once every seculum, for most Romans, they wouldn't see one of these. Or if they did, it might only occur when they're very old or very young. So having an extra one would be extraordinarily exciting. The Campus Martius is also home to two structures we'll talk about, the Arapacus and the Pantheon. One of the most well-visited sites in Rome, especially in antiquity, was the Circus Maximus. This was effectively a chariot racing stadium, which was between the Aventine and Palatine hills. It started out in the 6th century BCE and grew over time in continuous use until about the 6th century CE, at which point the city of Rome had become a little too poor and depopulated to continue to hold races. The Circus Maximus was about 2,000 feet long and 400 feet wide, and even after the construction of the Hippodrome in Constantinople in the 4th century CE, the Circus Maximus in Rome would always remain the largest track in the entire empire. This area around it for seating spectators had a capacity of around 150,000 people. This was an immense number of people who could be accommodated while watching a race. However, while there were about 57 days a year where games were held, this uh, place could also function as a bazaar. You could also set up shops here on a temporary basis and use it as a shopping center. There also were other entertainments held here when races weren't being held, so of those 57 game days, not all of them would be chariot races. You could also have foot races, you could have gladiatorial matches, you could have any number of entertainments that you wanted. And it was used for this purpose quite a bit until the construction of the Flavian Amphitheater, and sometimes even after that. In private, most elite Romans were huge Hellenophiles, that is to say that they loved all things Greek. But in public, this was not the case, and because of that, Rome had very few theaters, despite having produced a number of playwrights by the first century BCE. It was only in 55 BCE when Rome got its first permanent theater, and this was dedicated by Pompey the Great. Pompey, the previous decade, had added a great deal to the Roman Empire, including the areas of Palestine and Syria. So he was flush with cash. He actually overtook Crassus, the richest man in Rome, and he decided to make use of his wealth in order to lavish gifts upon the Roman people. So one of his chief gifts was the theater of Pompey. Famously, and ironically, this was the site of Caesar's assassination in 44 BCE. Caesar had defeated Pompey in a civil war just a few years before, and supposedly when he died, he died at the base of Pompey's statue at the theater named for Pompey. Both during Caesar's time and afterward, the theater of Pompey would often be used for meetings of the Senate. Um, the Senate house had been burned down in the 60s and it wasn't rebuilt for a while. And even after it was rebuilt, sometimes they would convene at the theater of Pompey for various reasons, even after the assassination of Caesar. The theater underwent a number of renovations and improvements, the last of which came from the Ostrogoths who ruled over Italy around 510 or so BC, uh, CE. After the time of the Ostrogoths, however, the wars of Justinian with the Goths and with the Lombards weakened Rome enough by cutting off many of its aqueducts that the city really shriveled away and as with the Circus Maximus, 
there no longer was really any demand for something like the Theater of Pompey, so it was allowed to decay. One of the best preserved pieces of Roman architecture and propaganda is the Arapacus from the Age of Augustus, located on the campus Martius. The Arapacus effectively tells the story of Augustus uniting the Roman world and bringing peace. There are some structures around the entire empire in most cities which have similar messages, the idea being that Augustus has triumphed and that the Roman world is better off for it. It also advertises the approval that the Senate had for Augustus and his family. It shows Augustus with many of his relatives, including his son-in-law and future successor Tiberius, walking in one direction in a procession, and also the Senate walking in the same direction, implying that they are one, they are unified. The structure is also utilized as a place for swearing oaths. This was helped out by the fact that it had an open roof so that the gods could look down from the heavens and witness what people were doing. So you couldn't tell a lie with the god's eyes on you, and in the presence of the deeds of Augustus, the man who was approved by the gods and also by the senate and people of Rome. Earlier I mentioned that there was a great fire in Rome in 64, and that this created opportunities to rebuild parts of the city. Nero tried to build a golden palace in his own honor, but after his downfall in the year of the four emperors, his ultimate successor Vespasian decided in 72 to construct a grand amphitheater for the entertainment of the people. This structure, the Flavian Amphitheater, better known as the Colosseum, was built by Vespasian and his son and successor Titus, and it opened up in 80 CE when Titus was on the throne. The structure could house up to 80,000 spectators, some estimates are a little lower, but 80,000 is on the higher end of that estimate, and it is technologically fairly impressive. It had a great deal of adaptability in terms of the kinds of entertainments it could provide. It had a huge arena floor, and it could be used to have animal hunts, executions, gladiatorial combats, athletic contests, dramas. And it even had the capacity to flood in order to provide a small place to hold naval battles. So it had hydraulics, it also had cages underneath to hold wild animals or prisoners, it could be lifted. Um, so this was a very intricate structure. And I remember reading somewhere that the level of technology used by the Flavian Amphitheater would not really be exceeded by any entertainment structure until about the 1950s. So this was well ahead of its time, and it remained a real marvel right up until it closed its doors during the last days of Rome. Next up is Trajan's Column. This structure was completed in the year 113 CE, just a few years before Trajan himself died. The column commemorates Trajan's victories over the Dacians during the previous decade. The Dacians, for context, are people who lived in what is today Romania, north of the Danube River. Trajan managed to crack into their empire after a series of hard-fought campaigns, which are detailed in the column itself. The visual representations of Roman soldiers serve as a baseline for our understanding of the equipment of the legions during the High Empire. It also gives us some insight into siege operations and Roman logistics, at least indirectly. Trajan's column is 115 feet tall, and the main body of it that you see here is built from 20 marble drums, each weighing 32 tons. Given how heavy the thing is, it comes as no surprise that it doesn't require any kind of adhesive or any sort of uh, rod running through it or anything of that nature. It is held together by the sheer weight of the thing. To even today, nearly two millennia later, Trajan's column is still very much the model for how one makes a victory column in grand fashion. Perhaps the best known of all Roman temples, the Pantheon was originally a temple designed by Marcus Agrippa. However, the structure had to be rebuilt about three times before it took its final form and this occurred under the Emperor Hadrian, who reigned from 117 to 141, 
and was one of the greatest builders of the empire. Hadrian, of course, is most famous for constructing Hadrian's Wall in Britain, but we can also attribute to him the Pantheon. It appears possible, based on the testimony of the sources, that the name Pantheon is actually more of a nickname for the structure rather than the official name. The inscription on the outside, which came from the first version of it, says that it was dedicated by Agrippa, so perhaps it was known as Agrippa's Temple or something of that nature. Originally, it seems to have had many statues of gods surrounding it on the outside to represent the fact that this was a place where you could worship all of them in one place. The Pantheon was also one of the original dome structures. The dome will be used very heavily in Constantinople and then in subsequent civilizations which copy Roman architecture. This was really the first major building to have a dome, and in many ways it's still probably the most impressive. The Pantheon remains as one of the most impressive feature, uh, achievements of Roman architecture, and today it still stands, although it was stripped of many of its internal decorations and repurposed as a Christian building by the Catholic Church many years ago. When we think of the Roman Empire, we typically think of some of the great pieces of architecture, especially the infrastructure that Rome built in the provinces, the grand aqueducts and road networks and all of that. And while the Romans did borrow these technologies from other civilizations, the aqueduct was fundamentally a more Greek way of providing water. The Romans were the ones who really did all of this on a grand scale. And the first place where they started doing this was in the city of Rome itself. So we're going to be taking a look at some of the key pieces of infrastructure in the city of Rome. It was only this infrastructure, these roads, bridges, and aqueducts, which enabled the Romans to maintain large population centers, including the city of Rome itself. We'll also take a look at the city walls of Rome, as those, of course, were important for providing protection. Another purpose that walls served in general in Rome's defensive scheme was that it enabled citizens to hold out while the Roman legions arrived and repelled the enemy. So these walled cities were a major part of Rome's defense plan, both early in the Republic during the Second Punic War when Rome was invaded by Hannibal, and even to the end of the empire when the cities would often hold out against invasions whereas the countryside fell easily. Roads were important for facilitating troop movement, and that was probably their original intent. In that sense, they are much like the United States interstate highway system constructed by Eisenhower, who, as a young officer, decided that the military didn't have an efficient way to move across the country. However, a bigger effect from the construction of these great highways across the Roman Empire is that it really connected cities and markets and very much facilitated trade and growth. As for aqueducts, they were important for providing agricultural water, as well as sustaining large cities. As we'll see, Rome itself had about a million and a half inhabitants at its height and required 10 aqueducts. So yes, um, this was very much fundamental to creating and sustaining massive cities. They simply can't exist without this degree of engineering. Over the course of its history and antiquity, Rome was protected by two sets of defensive walls. The first set of walls, the Servian walls, were originally built during the 4th century BCE. Traditionally, and also incorrectly, the Romans attributed these walls to King Servius Tullius in the 6th century. However, archaeologists have shown that the walls were actually of 4th century origin. The Servian walls encompassed the perimeter of the seven hills of Rome, but nothing else besides. As you might imagine, almost as soon as those walls were constructed, Rome began to outgrow them. Surprisingly, a few portions of the wall remain, and many portions of it were actually integrated into other pieces of architecture. One important surviving piece is the Porta Esquilina, which was repurposed as the Arch of Gallienus, one of the later emperors of the empire. By the first century BCE, Rome had long outgrown its walls, 
But for the most part, Romans weren't worried about their city being attacked due to the success that their legions enjoyed in pretty much every war that they fought. Only for a brief time at the end of the second century were they even worried about a potential Gallic threat to Rome. So for the most part, the Romans just allowed the Servian walls to continue as sort of a nominal thing that just sort of blended in with the landscape and they had no real defenses for most of the city. In the third century, Rome began to fare more poorly on the frontiers during the so-called third century crisis. Well, this meant that emperors came along who decided that it was now plausible that Rome might come under attack from a major foreign foe. And so one of the emperors, Aurelian, decided to build a new circuit wall to protect more of the city. His walls were named after him, the Aurelian Walls. This created a 12 mile circuit covering most of the heavily populated sections of the city, but certainly not all of them. The walls averaged around 33 feet in height, and they featured both towers and gates. We also know from some of our sources, including the military writer Vagidius, that these towers and um, walls featured things like um, ballista, which are effectively crossbows that are the size of catapults and that these had to be replaced every so often because the ropes in them used for tension would go bad and whatnot. And because the Romans typically didn't face that many threats at Rome itself, these were often not in proper repair when they were actually needed. As most of you probably know, Rome famously got sacked in 408 and again in 450 or 55 or something like that. Effectively, Aurelius's walls, or, I mean, Aurelian's walls were more or less outdated even by the time they were built because of the 6,000 or so inhabited acres of Rome during his time, the 270s, only about 3,500 acres were encompassed within the new walls. Nonetheless, this was an obvious step up from the Servian walls, which were clearly underwhelming. There's an old cliche which holds that all roads lead to Rome. In the Roman world, this was literally true, and it's also not a coincidence since Rome was authorizing the construction of all these roads, and they were ultimately designed to facilitate movement to and from Rome. The Appian Way is the first and perhaps most famous of these roads. Originally constructed, or at least authorized, in 312 by a censor named Appius, the road would be completed in 264, and the purpose of it was to connect Rome with Brundisium on the Adriatic coast. The primary purpose was to access eastern Italy easily for troops and for trade, and this is also designed in order to skirt the south of the Apennine Mountains, since those could be somewhat of an obstacle to rapid movement. This would enable the Romans, not much later than this, to embark their armies at Brundisium and then send them onward to Sicily or to the east. Brundisium as a major port would be used heavily during Rome's lengthy wars with Macedon and Greece, and also used by Caesar as he was pursuing Pompey into Greece during their civil war. The Appian Way is still in use in many ways, although today it is not used by vehicles, lest the vehicles should damage this historical landmark, but rather as sort of a tourist attraction and as a bike trail. Of course, some sections of it no longer exist, but a lot of parts do. And this is true for most Roman roads, the parts that exist still and are not being used actively as commercial highways are now more or less preserved areas that people like to go and hang out and sometimes even utilize for running or biking or what have you. In our previous slide, we saw that Trajan constructed a more northerly alternative to the Via Appia. This was because all of the other major parts of Italy had already been connected by other roads constructed during the Republic. Eventually, the Romans were able to construct enough major roads to fully connect all of Italy. Each of these roads would take the name of an official, typically the censor who approved them, but sometimes the roads would be approved by consuls. And that would therefore be 
an everlasting testament to that person's family. The Appian family was very prominent, and of course the Via Appia would be their ultimate monument in the end. While the best known structures of Rome are probably the Pantheon and the Flavian Amphitheater, the best known kind of structure from the imperial period would without a doubt be the aqueduct. And while the aqueducts of the provinces, especially in Spain and modern day France, are the most impressive examples of Roman engineering, the aqueducts of Rome itself, the city, were no less important. Until the first aqueduct was constructed in 312, Rome relied almost entirely on the Tiber and on wells. Most likely, given the reactive nature of Roman government, Rome had needed aqueducts for a while, but the leadership was a little bit reluctant to get around to that. It was in 312, the same year when the censor Appius approved the first major road, that he also approved the first major aqueduct, the Aqua Appia. This means that Appius, the censor of 312, was quite an important guy in Roman history, and it should come as no surprise that many of his descendants held the consulship. After all, they could point to their ancestral accomplishments by simply pointing to the nearby aqueduct and also asking people if they had ever heard of the Via Appia. Pretty easy argument to make in terms of establishing your bona fides and the fact that your family has done stuff. The city of Rome by the third century had grown enough that it required 10 different aqueducts. And in some cases, this was not because the city had grown beyond what it had been, say, a couple hundred years before that, but rather that some of the aquifers that earlier aqueducts were drawing on had dried up to some extent, and therefore Rome needed to pour in more water to make up the difference. At its peak in terms of population, which would have been around 150 CE, before the Antonine Plague took out about a third of the empire's population, Rome itself had perhaps one and a half million inhabitants. Some estimates hold it as low as a million or as high as two million, so 1.5 million seems like a fairly middle of the road estimate for the total number of Romans. And if we compare that with the number of people who were able to get into the Flavian Amphitheater or the Circus Maximus, we see that while this was not a huge percentage of the city, it was still a pretty considerable chunk of the number of people who would want to attend any given event. So uh, Rome's amenities were fairly generous in that regard. While it lacks the sheer majesty of some of the grand aqueducts of the provinces, perhaps the most iconic aqueduct in Rome itself is the Aqua Virgo. This engineering project was overseen and completed in 19 BCE by Marcus Agrippa, the famous friend of Augustus, who did so much to reshape Rome and also to create the empire in the first place. The water level of the source is only four meters higher than the destination of the water in the Campus Martius. In general, aqueducts operate on a principle where it uses the um, downward trajectory of the water to create a flow in order to get water from point A to point B. And the Aqua Virgo is one of the best examples of not needing much um, verticality to achieve that flow. So even though it does not look as impressive on the outside as some of its uh, counterparts, it very much is. This aqueduct is actually still in use, believe it or not, because in the 15th century, one of the popes decided to have it heavily renovated and re reopened as the Aquae Virgini. Right now, the Aqua Virgo still supplies a few places in Rome with water, including, most famously, the Trevi Fountain. Some of the locals of Rome believe that the Aqua Virgo has healing qualities, so some Romans, when they are sick today, will actually try to drink this water in order to gain the benefits of its healing powers. Speaking of the need for water in Rome, while most of it was used for drinking water, a good portion of it was also used for other purposes, including bathhouses, one of the distinctive features of Roman and, as the Romans would say, civilized life. 
Rome featured a number of important bathhouses, some of which were private, others of which were open to the public. The most famous surviving example of a bathhouse is the Bath of Caracalla. Caracalla was an emperor in the early 3rd century. He is primarily remembered now for murdering his brother and being tyrannical, and also for granting universal citizenship across the Roman Empire. However, his most lasting monument was the Bath of Caracalla. It was fueled by wood and coal fires under the floor. The fires which kept bathers warm were more or less stoked by slaves living underground, or at least working underground, maybe not living there. The baths of Caracalla were popular because they were free to the public. You simply went in and slaves would take your garments, you would go bathe, play around, and then leave. Rome did not have fully functional bathing centers in the way that we would think of it. However, being able to effectively rinse off, perhaps sponge yourself down a little bit, was certainly better than nothing. And if you consider how nasty the city was as a whole, this was really the only way to keep the stink down to some extent. The only other option was to sort of cover yourself with perfume. Romans apparently liked to bathe with lavender when possible to help uh, conceal other scents. And they often used perfume and other types of uh, body ointments to try to make themselves smell a little better. Without baths like the ones that Caracalla built, this would have been a pretty futile task. A source during the 5th century, Olympiodorus of Thebes, tells us that the baths of Caracalla could accommodate 1,600 bathers at a time. Based on this estimate and also looking at the structure, modern scholars think that about six to 8,000 visitors per day could have come to the baths of Caracalla and washed themselves off. As I mentioned, there were many other baths in Rome, so finding one of them should not have been too much of a problem for most people. The Babs of Caracalla served as a model for later buildings, including Pennsylvania Station and Chicago Union Station, neither of which, of course, is a bathhouse, but the architecture is similar. Speaking of that, did you notice that the Flavian Amphitheater and the stadium at Ohio State look a lot alike? That's not a coincidence. Perhaps you also noticed that the United States Capitol building and the Pantheon bear a certain resemblance in terms of the dome structure. That too is not a coincidence. So I'll leave you with this thought. Roman architecture, which more or less took its highest um, form in the city of Rome itself, still exercises a profound grip on the imaginations of architects today, and I don't imagine that that is likely to change anytime soon.